Good morning. This is uh, Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. It's April 26th of 2020 and we're still in uh, social isolation from COVID-19. We worship by, by conference call and I'm doing the Bible text and a sermon to put up on YouTube for anybody who couldn't make it there. If anybody would like the code to get into our service, I'd be happy to give you the number and the code. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John. Uh, verses 1 through 14. This is the last of the gospel itself and also the last uh, appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on by the shore, but uh, the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you got any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with some fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. If Jesus told you to go to Galilee to meet him, where in Galilee would you go? Well, if your parents lived in Galilee, obviously you would go there. So the first thing I want to say about the disciples is that they went home. Now, many of us are in a situation where our parents are no longer alive, but many also remember what it's like when you go home in that sense of the word. You know, I've moved around a fair bit, and I know that there was a comfort to going home. I don't mean to the house where I live now, I mean to the house where my parents lived, where I grew up, in the beautiful hills of my hometown, to the place where every street and corner has memories, to the cemetery where my parents and my grandparents are now buried. There is a unique kind of comfort to it. But when you go home as an adult, you ought to earn your keep. And even though Jesus had been crucified and risen from the dead, still the disciples and their families must eat, so they went fishing. It can be very nice to focus on a simple task. Fishing, crocheting, cooking. It's useful. You don't have to think too hard. But they were out all night and didn't catch a single fish. Then after sunrise, they were thinking about going in and there's some joker on the shore who tells him to put the net on the other side of the boat. Okay, That's only a few feet away from where the net is now. I'm not sure I would have heeded this advice. But the disciples do it. Lo and behold, they catch an enormous quantity of fish. So John looks back at the guy on the shore and suddenly recognizes him. It's Jesus. He pokes Peter and says, It is the Lord! Never one for half measures, Peter jumps in the water and swims toward Jesus. The other disciples take the boat in. People helps them with the haul of 153 fish. 
There's one detail of the story I find especially interesting. Jesus already has some other cooked fish and some nice warm bread by the fire. There is Jesus, and they don't have to wait for nourishment. He already knows their hunger, their need, and has prepared everything. I've got more to say, but I don't want to stray from this point too quickly. There is Jesus, food for the soul. And there is fish and bread reminiscent of the fish and bread he used to feed thousands. And there is the fire, take away the morning chill. And there are each other, good friends, spiritual companions, co-workers, fellow Christians, partners, those whom we love. And then there's this little odd detail in verse 10. Even though he already has food prepared, he tells them to bring some of the fish you've just caught. Despite the fact that there is enough for their immediate need, it seems that he wants to have some more prepared to share. Jesus is like that. He thinks ahead about how to help others. He loves our contributions to his work. He sets a good example of how to care for others. We are part of the church, the body of Christ, and we should be as generous as we can in providing for others and showing God's love. Now, despite the idyllic nature of this scene, there is an underlying tension. Verse 12 tells us none of the disciples dare to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. How often it is that some lingering sin, some sense of guilt or shame, keeps us bound up and captive. Of course, in this case, it's Peter. Peter who swore he would follow Jesus through anything, through thick and thin, he would risk his life, and then denied him three times. You know, sometimes we just can't bring ourselves to believe that Jesus could forgive that thing we did, or that he could really love us as much as he does. Notice that Jesus waits until they finish eating before he speaks to Peter. He wants to provide for our basic needs first. Only then does he engage us about the harder things. Here's how the conversation goes. I'm going to read verses 15 to 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went when you, where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said to him, follow me. There's a lot that could be said about this, but I'll settle on just a few overarching points. The single most important question is this, do we love Jesus? Everything else flows from that. If you find yourself growing weary, think about Jesus, how much he loves you and provides for you. And then think about how much you love him and your story of faith of how you came to love him. This will correct all things, just remembering how we love Jesus. Second, notice how taking care of the sheep and the lambs flows from loving Jesus. It is a natural outcome. We love Jesus, so we love other people. Third and last, loving Jesus does not mean that life will always be easy. Jesus alludes to how Peter will die a hard death, a martyr's death one day. When Jesus concludes, then with an admonition to follow him, which naturally arises from loving him and loving others. That's it. 
It's really all there is to it. Many sermons have an application piece at the end. I'm going to leave that to you. You know yourself, the state of your soul, the way the current COVID-19 crisis is affecting you, and it does affect all of us, whether we admit it or not. Remember Jesus' provision and comforting presence. Remember how much you love him. Be diligent about any opportunity to help others. If you do all those things, you won't have any trouble applying this passage to your life as it is right now. I know that you are faithful and I know that you will do this. I love you all and I would be happy to be of any help I can. Don't hesitate to contact me. In Jesus' name, amen. I end with uh, just a little word from the very last verse in the whole book. It says that Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Probably part of that is because as part of the body of Christ, we reach out to others and help others. So look for ways to do that this week. And the credit doesn't really matter, but it'll be credited as one of the things Jesus did as well as the one of the things you did because we do it together as part of the Christian body. Amen.